Welcome to Supply Chain Now, the voice of global supply chain. Supply Chain Now focuses on the best in the business for our worldwide audience, the people, the technologies, the best practices, and today's critical issues, the challenges and opportunities. Stay tuned to hear from those making global business happen right here on Supply Chain Now. Hey, hey, good morning, everybody. Scott Luton and Greg White with you here on Supply Chain Now. Welcome to today's episode. Greg, how you doing? I'm doing really good, Scott. It's good to be here. Absolutely. Kind of feels like Groundhog Day sometimes around here, right? You know, it but, does. It feels like we just did this seconds ago. <laughs> but hey, you know what? What also adds to the deja vu on today's episode, we're bringing back one of our faves, right? A rock and roll star in global supply chain. And we're getting right. his expert take on what to expect in 2023 when it comes to rail, trucking, and ocean freight. So Greg should be a great episode, right? Yeah, I don't know what episode this will come out as, but 108 was his original. Um, and if you want to, you can see him on television. That's right. That is right. So with no further ado, I want to welcome in Lee Klaskow, Senior Analyst for Transportation and Logistics with Bloomberg Intelligence, a.k.a. Logistics Lee. Lee, how you doing? I'm doing fantastic. Thanks for having me, guys. You bet. Well, uh, Yeah, welcome we're, aboard. Uh, as Greg suggested, and we're going to touch on, you know, I'm going to go ahead and touch on this now. Uh, so as Greg mentioned, Lee, you first appeared with us on episode 108. Now, um, today we're publishing, now today is going to be, you know, two weeks or so before this episode publishes, but today we're publishing episode 1047, 1047. So Lee, on behalf of our team here, you've earned OG status through six or seven appearances here at Supply Chain Now. Well, thank you very much. I can't wait to get my badge uh, or and <laughs> class in the mail. I appreciate that. And congratulations to you guys. It's uh, always a pleasure to speak with you. Oh, Absolutely. Greg, we get a lot of feedback around Lee's appearances here and, and what he brings to the table, right? Yeah. I mean, uh, I think we should be honored to have him here. I mean, he really does do this thing on television. I've seen him. The default channel on my on my TV at the beach is is the Bloomberg channel, which you know has all the cool stuff off to the side. Turn it on one day and there's Lee talking to, I can't remember who, but it was I think it was the English guy who does the opening of the euro uh market thing and uh so we are among greatness no that's right question. lee's agent stays busy but all of that <laughs> aside we're going to dive into his uh industry take here in just a second but before we do uh we want to for the handful of listeners that may be new to lee and really the handful like three of you out there um let's get to know lee class got a little better i want to start greg this has been a popular question as of late the hard-hitting question so lee mm. It's the holiday season's upon us, right? Uh, what is your family's all-time favorite seasonal movie, I'll call it? Prop, I mean, I'm not going to say Die Hard because uh, <laughs> there's a lot of controversy about whether Die Hard is a, uh, a Christmas movie. So Did you watch I'll our get, show the other day? Because we had exactly oh, that controversy. <laughs> yeah, it, there, it, there's a huge controversy. Yeah. Uh, Bruce Willis said it is not a holiday movie, so I'm going to go with what he says. So because of that, I'll probably say like Christmas Story, you know, that's just a classic that, uh, you know, I can watch a gazillion times, um, you know, that maybe Christmas Vacation are probably my, my two favorites. You'll oh, put man. your eye out with that thing, kid. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, so, okay. So Christmas Vacation is certainly my family's all-time favorite. Uh, of course, Greg, the other day, we, The Elf was mentioned. Yeah. Uh, that's a great just one. Elf. Or, or, just Elf. Sorry. Drop the the. Sorry. Sorry. Right. Uh, Greg, what's what's your what's one of y'all's all time favorite? Yeah, the Elf is, Elf is a new favorite for us. Before that, it was uh, Jim Carrey's version of The Grinch. So I think we love the kind of um, live animation <laughs> type shows. But uh, yeah, and of course, all of the old Rankin Bass stuff. I still, you know, I'm still pulling for those toy those misfit toys. You know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I like that's a great reference. Uh, and we got to throw this one in. Uh, also, recent favorites. You know, my kids have really enjoyed Home Alone and Home Alone 2. Uh, a lot of good stuff there. Good family uh, programming. Okay, so switching gears. So, again, we've, we've already referenced uh, Lee's been with us. I think this is his seventh appearance, right, over the years uh, from you know, episode 108 to uh, whatever this episode number will be. So, again, for the handful of listeners, beyond your favorite holiday movies, 
Lee, let's get to know you a little better. So uh, for starters, where'd you grow up, Lee? I grew up in uh, northern New Jersey and it didn't, uh, you know, I didn't didn't really move too far off from there. I've always stayed in New Jersey for the most part, had a short stint uh, overseas in London, but uh, mostly New Jersey. You know, I'm a, I'm a finance person. So, you know, being around Manhattan is, is uh, extremely important uh, for that kind of a profession. So I've always been close to to Manhattan, um, you know. I'm about uh, 20 miles outside of Manhattan, not right now, but it can take uh, up to two hours to get there. So, yeah. but it's, you know, it's, it's <laughs> yeah. fantastic. Depends uh, on the bridges and tunnels, doesn't it? Exactly, exactly. Well, so uh, I'm not sure. I'm trying to think about questions we haven't asked you in your previous appearances, and I'm not sure if we've ever talked about food from your upbringing. So is there one dish? This is this. is You're going to have the audible here to call whichever you'd like. So okay. is there one dish from your upbringing there in New Jersey that you just love, that was inseparable, that you, you reminisce back and, and wish you could eat it today? Or the opposite of that question, is there a dish that uh, maybe you, you ate with your folks that you you hope you'll never have to eat again? Well, I, I guess as a kid, I'd probably, you know, the stuff that I ate as a kid, I'd probably be most reminiscent about my mother's brisket. You know, it's just, uh, that just has like, you know, uh, those flavors and taste just, you know, brings back a lot of fond memories in terms of things that I would never eat again. Um, it's funny, a uh, tuna casserole. Um, Ooh, yeah, good but I did actually make it for my kids about a, two years ago and I'm embarrassed. Were they grounded to say it? or had they angered <laughs> you in some way? Of it, and it was delicious. Um, <laughs> so I don't know. Maybe it was nostalgic, and but uh, yeah, as a kid, I hated it. Um, but uh, it, yeah, it, 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 it was reborn in my household. My kids hate it. They 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 thought it was disgusting. My wife thought it was disgusting. <laughs> Not a fan of hot tuna fish. Um, so, yeah, there you go. Well, you know, uh, so I had a dear old roommate. Uh, I love you, Philip. But he made tuna grits regularly, and. Talk about a stench mm. that would leave you leaving the house in, in a hurry. Uh, Greg, you weigh, weigh in. I, I'm, I'm not sure if I've ever asked you, and you're, uh, given your upbringing, is there a dish that you uh, recall fondly? Yeah. Um, I, fried chicken is my all-time favorite meal, and just made in a skillet, I really enjoyed that. Absolutely will never again in my life eat what we call in Kansas cowboy beans, which is beans and ham hocks. Hate it. Despise it. Will never eat it ever again. I, because I don't have to. <laughs> Fried chicken's my go-to cheat meal. That's, uh, oh, my um, gosh. So worth it, too. Well, yeah. and uh, I was reading just the other day, a chicken breast is is uh, down 70% since the beginning of the year. So it'll be uh, a go-to cheaper meal in hopefully in the weeks ahead, uh, Lee. Wow, um, that's really impressive. Yeah. Down 70%. How about that? Um, now, of course, the Super Bowl is around the corner, and we all know chicken wings will spike ridiculously during that, that time frame. But uh, anyway, um, all right. So now that we've really rekindled, uh, it's great to reconnect with Lee Klaskow here. We're going to move into his expertise and his insights and uh, get Greg's comment on it as well. So I want to start with, you know, Lee, I didn't realize this. I should have given all of your appearances, but you've been an analyst in the transportation and logistics space since 2004. So you could undoubtedly write a book, a New York Times bestseller perhaps, on what you've seen. So um, I want to start with, you know, what is one of your biggest surprises in industry in uh, 2022? Pro you know, honestly, it's probably the impact and duration of the Chinese lockdowns that they've had. Um, you know, I think that's had a huge ripple effect, uh, not only on supply chains, but also transportation companies and the global economy. Um, you know, there's kind of some early indications that they might start, you know, um, lifting some of those really stringent uh, lockdown policies that they have, which would be, you know, good for, for the global economy. Um, but, you know, they just had a spike of COVID cases. So who knows what they're going to do, um, you know, going forward. Um, you know, Bloomberg Economics, they, they think that uh, China is not going to be fully open until, uh, you know, mid next year. Um, you know, fingers crossed that that'll happen a little earlier than that if these, um, you know, measures that they've been taking recently kind of stick, even if as, um, you know, infection rates rise. 
So that's certainly, uh, Greg, I'm looking forward to your comments there um, when it comes to China and, and their COVID policies and impact on industry. Your thoughts, Greg? Yeah, I'm, I'd say the uh, prolonged nature of it is really surprising. The impact, of course, I, I mean, um, I think we all could have probably guessed that. But man, just how long they have kept or continued to re-shut down uh, the economy there. And it's really hurt their economy as well. Um, mm. You know, the thing, you know, the X factor we have to consider is they can completely control their, you know, the Chinese Communist Party can completely control the economy and most importantly, the constituency, right? They don't really get elected. And Xi Jinping mm. did just get reelected for effectively life, I think, just recently. So, <clears throat> uh, but yeah, it is hugely impactful. And, and though, and I think we've talked about this before with Lee, and that is, you know, even if we want to get out of China, which of course a lot of companies do for a lot of reasons, um, but, you know, you couldn't accumulate all of the production capacity in Southeast Asia, maybe, including hundreds of other companies or countries around the world and equal the, the production capacity that China can have when they're running at full capacity. Mm. So it's a real challenge and the impact is enormous. Yep, well said. Uh, we've been way too dependent upon that market for way too long. Uh, so we'll see how, how it progresses moving forward. Um, okay, I wanna shift gears, Lee. Um, moving from biggest surprises, uh, let, let's gain your insights into what we might can expect in 2023. And I appreciate as, as Greg mentioned, maybe on the front end of the show, I appreciate how uh, bold and willing you are uh, to give expectations next year, but especially given the last few years where, man, what hasn't happened, right? So let's start with the railroad industry. And we all know what's going on there with the uh, the, the labor issues, potential strike and, and the like. Um, what do you expect in 2023 when it comes to railroads? Yeah, so, um, you know, the, the labor issues seem to be more or less in, in the rearview mirror, um, you know, but the rails are dealing with a, a lot of service issues that they're trying to fix. Um, you know, today, as we're recording this, uh, the CEO of Union Pacific is uh, going to testify to the STB. Uh, the STB wants to know, you know, why Union Pacific uh, has had so many service issues this year relative uh, to its peers. I mean, they've all had service issues, and a lot of that stems from labor, some weather, uh, and some. Um, but you know, the, the reality is is that uh, the rails in general just are have been operating uh, from a, I would say a subpar performance in, in on time uh, performance, dwell times. You know, are high train uh, speeds are where they should be. Uh, and that's, you know, not only hurt uh, service, but it also hurts the rail's ability to take on more freight because people, shippers might say, well, I, I, you know, for this load, I'm going to use a truck or I'm going to try to find an alternative when you can. Obviously, you can't find an alternative all the time because, right. you know, some he heavy freight just doesn't make sense if you're um, to put on a truck or if you're not by a river. Um, so I think, you know, it's, there's a huge opportunity cost for the railroads because of the subpar service. So I do believe that they're motivated to get back not only to where they were before the pandemic, but to also improve upon that. Uh, because, you know, if they provide a better service and better on-time performance, that actually creates capacity without adding much in the terms of assets and then just allows them to take on more business and more profitable business at that. Uh, so, you know, that's that's something that, you know, we're looking at uh, week to week in terms of trying to see if service is improving by looking at the fluidity metrics that we get. Um, and then looking into next year, you know, listen, it's probably going to be a GDP kind of year. Uh, you know, the rails are, are, are trending negative this year. Uh, they were negative, uh, you know, um, so 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 when we look at where we expect volumes to be next year, you know, it's going to be probably flat. Um, you know, there's going to be areas of strength. You know, ag is going to be good uh, just because A, it has easier comparisons. The Canadians have a really robust uh, Canadian, uh, you know, grain crop this year. Autos are going to be a positive because easier comps, right? The production right. cycles are getting better as uh, chip availabilities has totally uh, been, been improving. And, you know, inventories at dealerships are pretty low. So those are two areas that are going to be good. Coal, you know, really depends on the global global markets and where prices are. If whether or not 
you know, U.S. coal is competitive on the global markets right now. It is, but it's got certainly some tough comparisons going into next year. Uh, and, you know, intermodal is really going to be dependent um, on, you know, where the economy is heading. And like I mentioned earlier, service levels, you know, so that's so that's on the volume side and on the pricing side. The rails have been pretty good at, at getting pricing above, above inflation, which, you know, should help, uh, you know, generate, um, you know, decent, uh, you know, low low single digit maybe earnings growth next year okay man we ask for an outlook and he brings it by the real car uh Greg. oh boy <laughs> you went there seriously that is uh like few an industry can do so we've got two more segments uh, that we're going to look at in a second but greg weigh in on what uh you heard him share at least share about the railroad industry yeah, well, what I heard him share was a lot that I don't know. I mean, it's a very complex industry. I'm thankful for people like Lee who keep their <clears throat> finger on the pulse of that because uh, it's complex, as everyone just heard there. And, um, you know, intermodal for what for anyone who doesn't know means it, it arrives on a – usually arrives on a ship, winds up on a train, and then winds up on a chassis behind a semi. So – um, that is, you know, every, so much, not everything, so much hits the ground on rail, um, that the impact has been huge. And, and particularly with the impact of, you know, things like the Mississippi drought and things like that, that has really caused issues in all kinds of transportation, not just, um, barge transportation as well. But, um, you know, it's, it's going to be interesting because the, the, uh, unions were essentially forced into an agreement, which at best a third of the unions didn't agree with. Um, and, you know, we've heard rumblings, you know, off the record that even the ones who agreed, agreed, many of them agreed uh, under duress, to say the least. So uh, it's going to be, an, it's going to be a really interesting ride. Demand's going to shift big time this year as the country goes into deeper recession and, and as, you know, as, as people continue to um, shift their lifestyles based on, I mean, if you think about it, this time last year, we were still sub under some pretty substantial COVID restrictions, though um, people were, were getting out. Um, I'm thinking about, and we've been talking about what, you know, the island looked like last year uh, versus this year and what labor looked like last year versus this year and to you know, at least point it's, there's much greater availability, but there's still people, um, counting on their side hustle for, or whatever you want to call it for, um, income. And I have a feeling that uh, along with the other issues, tech and other layoff issues that have been substantial this year, I think we could see some of these smaller manifest businesses, um, struggle, which is going to shift demand as well. So it's going to be, it's going to be really interesting for the next couple of years. You know, what's really interesting and Lee, I don't know. I mean, you, you have to have seen some of this and, but what's really interesting is that with all of this disruption, all of which occurs when eco economic shifts and, and other geopolitical um, impacts occur. But of all of this, I think one of the things that has changed the most is the awareness among the gen general public, right? Consumers know how supply chain works now. And, it matters to them, both from an ESG standpoint and just from a deliverability and cost standpoint. They are starting to understand the impact that things like rail and trucking and inflation, right, and economic shifts and geopolitical shifts have on their ability to get goods at the price that they want them. So, Lee, let's get you to respond to that, and then we're going to move into the trucking uh, industry. Get your thoughts there. Your, uh, your response to that, Lee. Yeah, so... Um you know, that, that, that was a lot. And there's a lot of things I can comment on, you know, on, on the recession uh, standpoint, you know, yeah, it does look like uh, we're going to recession. You know, I think the probability on Bloomberg is around a 65% chance now that we're going to go into recession. Recession usually happens when like the yield curve is inverted, which it is when there's commodities shocks. And, you know, we talk about inflation, obviously a lot of that had to do with commodities. So, you know, the big spike up in commodities, um, you know, that's, that's, that's something, that's something else. Um, and then, you know, also when the Fed begins to tighten and as everyone, you know, if you just read the paper or look at your credit card statement or, you know, right. you know, mortgage, 
Um, you know, they've, they've been increasing, you know, uh, rates considerably. I guess the good news is that CPI has kind of tapered off in November. That was reported earlier today. Um, you know, I think the increase uh, I have written down here for total was 0.1 month to month and uh, plus 7.1 percent year over year. Uh, that's uh, so that that is, you know, good news because it, it, it increased at, its, uh, at a lower lower rate and lower than what people expected. Right. And so, you know, when that happens, the market's like, oh, the Fed's not going to tighten as much as maybe we thought they might. So maybe instead of 75 basis points, it's 50 basis points or 25 basis points. Um, so, you know, we might be coming not at the end, but, you know, getting closer to the end of the Fed tightening cycle, which uh, would, would be good for uh, the economy. And, and I'm still, you know, optimistic and I and I am I'm always a, a glass half uh, full of, uh, of a nice wine, a glass of wine <laughs> uh, kind of guy um, or moonshine. Right. Um, That's right. I'm, I'm not that particular. Um, but like, you know, so, so, you know, I think it's going, I think we still can manage, I'm not going to say a super soft landing, right. but I don't think the, the, the any recession is going to be, you know, long and deep, you know, I, I joke around, I think it's going to be, you know, a recession that might be named after me, you know, short and shallow. Uh, <laughs> so I think that that would be optimal, uh, for, for not only the economy, but, you know, consumers as well, you know, and, and, and. And we, you know, you also talked about the labor issues. Um, you know, I, I think that rails are going to have to address sick, 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 sick days, which was the real sticking point. Right. Um, you know, not only, you know, there's some activist investors that have been, you know, voicing their concerns from an ESG standard, uh, which is, you know, becoming extremely important. I mean, they were small investors uh, in these companies that, you know, they, they owned like less than 1%. Um, but, you know, they're, ESG investors are starting to make noise about how it's important. And I also think that the rails, you know, Norfolk Southern kind of highlighted this at their analyst day. I think it was last year, last week in Atlanta, uh, which, we, which we went to, uh, you know, about the fact that they're not, you know, myopically focused on their margins. You know, they're really looking for profitable growth uh, and they really believe that, you know, they're probably going to have to operate a little fatter, if you will, during the cycle. Mm. You know, in other words, don't furlough as much as they did in previous cycles, because what they're realizing is the costs, not only, you know, to 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 get the network back to where it, it should be from a service standpoint, but also to hire and to train people, it, it doesn't really pay to start furloughing. You're really not saving that much money. You might save a little bit that first quarter, right. but when you look at, you know, years out, it's actually, you know, costing you not only an additional cost, but like I was mentioning earlier, the opportunity costs of, of lost volumes to trucking or right. um, you know, to, 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 uh, to other to other modes. Um, so, you know, I, I think I think they're really going to be taking a hard look at sick days um, and, and, you know, the workers ability to take off. And for them to do that, they have to have people, you know, waiting in the wings to come in and, and sub because, you know, the rails operate uh, under precision scheduling railroading, which is kind of like Six Sigma for the rails. And the real goal of that is is a lean operating uh, system. And, and I think that people, um, you know, are not going to be operating under PSR from an orthodox standpoint. And it's going to be more or less, you know, using what works and, you know, kind of bending to what they need to, to meet not only their, their labor needs, but also, you know, some concerns that some investors have about yeah. those uh, labor practices. All right. So I want to move his head into trucking for the sake of time, but, but a quick comment. Uh, we're talking um, uh, getting back to fight and weight uh, and fight and shape in the new year. Well, you know, you also mentioned the consumer price index there, Lee, and uh, um, salad, and all the ingredients that go in the salad, that's been one of the things that has been insulated from, from inflation pricing coming back down. I was reading the other day that um, Arizona, which grows, you know, Greg, I know you from your time there, lots of agriculture, right? That they grow a ton of, of vegetables there. Well, not only is pricing high right now there in farms in California, but as in January, uh, farmers in Arizona are going to get less water from the Colorado River as as more regulation comes into play based on those those water levels. 
So it may be tougher, but we may have, we may have, may have new excuses in January to keep eating chicken wings and burgers and other things because it's, it's, it's price, it's economically driven. Is that right, Lee? I see you smiling. Can we can we go with those excuses in January? Uh, I hope not. I you know <laughs> I'll, I'll let your viewers judge me. I need my kale. <laughs> I love kale. You need kale. That's right. Keep, keeps you regular. You know, fills you up. <laughs> All right, so I'm going to have to share, speaking of kale, uh, I'm going to have to share Amanda's, uh, my dear wife's, incredible kale salad dressing. I'm going to have to add that to uh, and, and share that with our supply chain now, global family. Okay, uh, so much fun, so little time. Uh, let's move into trucking. So, uh, Lee, I'd love to get your outlook for trucking in 2023, and then Greg, we can get your commentary as well. So, Lee, start us off. Yeah, so when we look at trucking, there's obviously two subsegments that we look at. We look at the truckload market and the less than truckload market. To focus on the truckload market, you know, um, the spot market there has been, you know, extremely volatile, right? We saw, you know, parts of the market about a year ago or even less than a year ago where, where conditions were so tight. You saw a flood of capacity coming into the market. And when those people were coming into the market, they were buying equipment at, at higher costs. So, you know, so they had a higher cost base. Now, fast forward to today, you know, uh, the need for the spot market has diminished because demand has diminished and supply chains are slowly getting back to normal. So that that pressure that people put, you know, for a uh, relief valve, if you will, within the spot market is, is, is totally changed. So what we're seeing is, is a rebalancing of the market. Um, and a lot of that um, high cost capacity is going to be you know, forced out of the market because they just can't make enough money. Um, that, that should be good for rates. You know, rates have gone down considerably. They're now like 26 or 27% year over year, excluding fuel surcharges. Um, you know, um, but you know, they still remain slightly above some pre pandemic levels. So it's not like all doom and gloom, but the higher cost people are, you know, getting pushed out. You know, we think that, you know, Mark, the market probably should turn around the second quarter, uh, in terms of, of spot rates. You know, we think there's some more room to go lower, uh, especially since this peak season has pretty, you know, been meh at best, uh, is very muted. What was that? Uh, what was that Lee? What was that? Man, man, <laughs> an economic man. term. <laughs> yes, <laughs> I love it. Okay, um, and and then and then so you know when you so when we look at the contractual rate because the the publicly traded trucking companies which we follow and and what we care about you know like the J B Hunts, the Knight Swifts, and the Warners of the world you know they're they're a small part of their business is spot you know five to ten percent depending on the cycle you know so that's going to translate into pressure on contractual rates now. From an apples to apple standpoint, you know, we don't think a lot of lanes are going to see significantly declines. But what you're going to see is that, you know, there was a lot of contracts priced last year because shippers were desperate for capacity. But that capacity was really kind of like spot, but they still priced it. Those lanes are going to be down, you know, 15 to 20 percent. But like, you know, most lanes are going to be down flat to slight, slightly, slightly negative. So net net, you know, we're expecting low to mid single digit lower contractual rates when you take that mix of everything together uh, for next year. That coupled with, you know, obviously some volume pressures are really going to weigh on um, on earnings. And not only are the the pricing and the volumes going to impact it, but you know, the, the, they were making good money selling used equipment. Uh, those prices have come down because of the demand in spot market is not as what it once was. Um, and so you could see rates, you know, or I'm sorry, earnings per share uh, down 15 to 18 mm percent, -hmm. kind of that 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 area. Uh, that's, I think, what, what the market is expecting today. Um, you know, and then and then on the less than truckload market, uh, that's that's geared more towards the industrial economy. Um, and if we go into recession, you know, that's probably going to be hit more. And the LTL industry has had a great couple of years. Um, they're going to continue to have strong pricing, probably mid single digits of price increases. It's a much more consolidated, rational business where, I don't know the stat, I'm probably going to not say it correctly, but something like the top 10 carriers have like 70 to 80% of the market. Um, and so it's a much more rational pricing environment. 
but they're going to face, you know, lower tonnage, A, because of difficult comparisons, and B, because of the weaker economy that, you know, we alluded to. Um, but, you know, earnings are not going to go down as nearly as much as you're going to see on the truckload side, you know, maybe, you know, low to mid single digit uh, in terms of earnings per share uh, next year. Uh, at, least, at least that's what the consensus is kind of modeling for. Okay. Very holistic outlook there. Gregory? What a mess. Um, I mean, when you look at, I mean, when you look at all this together, you know, you know, I tend to look at this from the demand side, from the shippers side. And um, what I see, frankly, a lot from the shipper side is a lot of relief that, you know, we're not in these insane um, days of rates. Um, though I have heard many people reflect on the ironies of the continued fuel surcharges, which are, which are left over from 2008, 2009, when fuel got to $5, $4.45 dollars a gallon, right? And continued even as fuel dipped well below that and now continue, even though fuel has, has dipped yet again. Um, so, you know, there's a lot, there's a lot of uh, obfuscation of what the actual rates are. It, I mean, when you say accept fuel surcharges, you know, it's arguable whether, I mean, not, not in this precise environment because diesel is still so expensive, but there are, the rate environment has become more and more difficult for shippers to discern with things like fuel surcharges and these, you know, um, shifting uh, demurrage and cartage charges as well. It's become a really, really complex environment for shippers. And I think that will continue Demand, as we just talked about, will continue to decline <clears throat> into and probably through next year. Again, uh, not just for Lee's benefit, but also for our audience. Not, I am not an economist, but I'm right <laughs> as often as they are, which is also <laughs> almost never. Um, so, <laughs> I mean, I think, you know, I think w whatever happens, I think there are a few things that we can, we can recognize is that, you know, to Lee's point, uh, truckload and LTL will do what he's talking about, but I think demand will continue to flutter and and um, maybe even reduce over what time span. Who knows? I mean, we don't get paid to guess that. Lee and his team get paid to guess that, and good on them. And mm. and I, you know, and I'm I'm sure they are right as much as <laughs> anyone else. So. Bet on it. Um, Bet well, on it's a little it. bit, you know, Lee even said it. It's a little bit like being a, a meteorologist, right? You just mm. hope nobody remembers that really, really <laughs> bold prediction. Or maybe a sports commentator. Right. right? For all those people it's who the green green. Around for the Super Bowl. That's right. What Sorry, was that, Lee? Lee? No, I'd say, I'm, yeah, a meteorologist without the green screen, so I don't. Yeah, I know. You don't get, you don't even get the, yeah. You got nothing to point at. Right. We can, yeah. we can fix that. We can fix that, Lee. We can fix that. Um, all right, a lot of just a lot, a lot of things to track. Uh, we, we've we've tackled the railroad industry and trucking. There's so much going on. It's tough to get it in the, even in an hour long show. Um, Lee, for the sake of time, let's move into ocean freight. It's really interesting. You know, this time a year ago, um, we were just talking yesterday, Greg. I want to say containers come come out of China for the West Coast was about twenty grand. And now they're less than two, at least what we we're uh, uh, tracking yesterday. So a lot of changes. To, uh, give us your outlook for 2023 for Ocean Freight Lee. Yeah, so rates that like you know when you talk about the 20 grand, like that's that's the spot market, and that's like with all the fees. Like if you just if you needed to get it like immediately, I mean those levels were obviously extremely unsustainable, and rates are down around 70 percent from there. They still remain above pre-pandemic levels, but you know they're going to continue to to track lower because volumes are expected to be lower next year because of the global economy. Um, so that's first and foremost. Then, if you look at the supply side in the second half of next year, supply is supposed to is there going to be a significant amount of supply hitting the water, uh, and so that's going to create excess more excess capacity than what the market already has. So you know when I look at 2022. You know, I don't, I don't anyone, anyone with like half a brain can easily say with a lot of confidence that 2022 was the peak for the con global container liner industry. 2023 is still going to be a decent year um, because shipping is a, is a cycle of booms and busts. Right. Mm -hmm. And the cycles have gotten shorter and, um, you know, more extreme um, for the industry. Uh, the. the 
most of the players, um, not all of them, are not rational when it comes to pricing. They have uh, shipping companies because you know it's in their uh, you know sovereign companies uh, c- countries' interest to have those and to support those industries. So they're somewhat subsidized. Um, and then there's others that are you know more operate uh, like a capitalist uh, uh, kind of um, organization. And so, you know, my point being is that there's going to be booms and busts. Um, next year is probably going to be a, a better than it was from an earning standpoint, um, from a, from a pre-pandemic standpoint. Uh, versus, I'm sorry, versus a pre-pandemic um, timing. Uh, but rates are just going to slowly continue to to, to go lower uh, until um, you know they kind of bottom out. But where that is, I have no no idea. Uh, it's really that's going to be dependent on, on on global demand, and it's going to be dependent on what we talked about in the beginning of show of the show. You know what China is doing because right. you know China influences um, you know the world's exports and imports because um, they're huge, the biggest importers of iron ore, coal. Um, you know, so we also look at the dry bulk industry. Um, you know, and that's been impacted along with the the crew tanker industry. Um, because of the the impact of uh, Russia's war in Ukraine, um, you know that's creating you know people have to find new sources for commodities uh, because of the sanctions that are in place. It happens to be a good thing for the tanker market. Um, so you know people that might have imported uh, Russian oil via a tanker are now looking at you know importing that order oil from either the U.S. or the Middle East, and those have longer ton miles. Uh, which you know soaks up capacity. Mm. So you know we're we're probably most bullish about the the crude tanker market next year uh, relative to the dry bulk and and container liner markets. Okay, uh, Greg, weigh in on what we're seeing in ocean freight and into next year. Wow, you want to talk about an industry that <clears throat> I know nothing about? <laughs> I mean, it. I mean, sh- shipping. I only know it from having been a consumer of it in the past, but it's very complex. I can tell you that we have seen what, it, you know, both um, discussions and results very consistent with what Lee has said, which is it is a series of booms and busts. I mean, it was just last year that everyone was railing against all these shipping companies for making record profits now two years before. Um, and in the next two years when they are struggling to remain solvent, Nobody will be saying anything, but it is very much that, right? Nobody's going to be rushing to their aid with cash, all those complaining uh, shippers and consumers, Lee, right? Um, yep. But they'll that gladly is, take is, advantage of that statement. situation. They didn't complain when, you know, um, you know, uh, Trans-Pacific rates were under $1,000 and, you know, the, the liners were losing, you know, money on, on, on each shipment that they took. Um, right. So, you know, it's it's... You know, booms and busts. Last year was a total anomaly. Yeah. Um, you know, it was like a perfect storm in terms of you know what, what was going on in the global supply chain. Um, you know, the backups in, in LA, Long Beach are you know back to where they used to be. Um, you know, and you're just you're just seeing a more normalized environment coupled with demand that's you know not where where it should be. I mean, you know, peak season, like I said earlier, was meh. Uh, and, you know, we're not expecting a huge increase in, in, in exports until China fully reopens. Um, and, you know, the European economy is on better footing. And, you know, hopefully the U.S. economy doesn't slip too deep into a recession. Yep. And we've talked about situation after situation where companies have bulked up on inventory, right? We talked about Lululemon who increased their inventory by 85 percent. Guess where that inventory comes from and guess on what motive? transport. So, you know, the, the um, troubles, it, it is truly a whiplash effect. Um, although in, in this case, it's a very long lasting whiplash, right? So mm-hmm. um, what's going to, what is really going to depend or, or drive this is going to depend on how companies offload this mass of old inventory. I don't know what else to call it. Um, over the course of the next six to 12 months, because Roomba is just selling the, the I or uh, I robot is just selling the Roombas they got last year, this year, Mm. right. They held them over pack and hold. Right. We talked about that with 
Gap and all of their uh, companies and various and sundry other organizations who've done that. Even some of the best retailers, Costco, Walmart, Target, are incredibly overstocked. And we saw it hit their hit their uh, valuations early in the year and continue to do so as the goods that you have to order six to 12 months in advance continue to come over. So they, a lot of companies have, they've tried to euphemize it so that it doesn't shock their stock. Right. Uh, good luck with that. But they've all said, basically, we've stopped buying, mm. right? We have reduced our, our inventory consumption or our in, uh, inventory purchases into next year to see how fast this stuff sells down. Yep. Discount so, bonanza. Discount bonanza. Well, um, I mean, right. it's true that, you know, TJX, right? TJ Maxx is now competing with traditional retailers who are preferring to hold that inventory and discount it themselves rather yeah. than sell it off at liquidation prices to TJ Maxx. So it's created a substantially different dynamic in retail as well. Yep. So let's um, let's move into uh, leave for the ha- a handful of folks that may not know what you uh, do over at Bloomberg Intelligence. Let's talk about that. And then as we start to wrap, we want to make sure we uh, can connect our listeners to you. And, and I know you do a lot of keynotes out there in Marketplace. So tell us about Bloomberg Intelligence. Yeah, so Bloomberg Intelligence is Bloomberg's research arm. I mean, I'm sure most of your uh, uh, viewers know Bloomberg, uh, Bloomberg.com, um, you know, great uh, financial uh, news organization that's, uh, you know, widely recognized around the globe. Uh, their investment, I'm sorry, their their research arm has around 350 uh, analysts globally. Uh, I cover it from an, I cover transports from an equity standpoint, but we have analysts that cover uh, things from a credit uh, and ESG litigation uh, strategy. Uh, so, so we pretty much do the whole gamut. We cover over 2000 companies globally. Uh, and I, I think the number is over 150 uh, industries globally. So we pretty much cover any business aspect that you're looking uh, for and any asset that you're looking for. So whether it's fixed income, equity, commodity, uh, we, we're, we're kind of or we're kind of looking at it. Um, I, you know, I've been with, uh, I think, Bloomberg for 12 years now. Uh, prior to that, I was an Excel side analyst on Wall Street covering transports for about six years, five or six years. Um, if you want to get in touch with me, I'm on LinkedIn. Um, K L A S K O W is my last name, uh, and I'm also on uh, Twitter. Uh, my handle's uh, at Logistics Lee, um, and you know, feel free to reach out, follow me. You know, always uh, love talking to people that are interested in transports. Uh, it's a fascinating industry. You know, I fell into it or right. stepped into it, depending on you know how you want to say it. <laughs> Most uh, of us but- came into it the same way, right? <laughs> Yes, yes. Um, and, um, you know, uh, it's, just, uh, it's just a fascinating industry uh, with fascinating people. Uh, and it's really, you know, I don't care what anyone else says, you know, one of the most uh, important industries, because uh, without it, we would not, you know, have medicine, we would not have food, we would not have shelter, we would not have, you know, all the stuff that I got behind me. Right. Um, uh, and, the, you know, and the, and the clothes that I'm wearing. Uh, and it's, uh, you know, there's a lot of unsung heroes that, that are, that, that are participating it, you know, from, the, from the guy or gal and the, the, you know, the, the, the loading dock to the trucker, uh, to, you know, the, uh, the engineer conductor on the rail to the seaman, um, all the way up to, you know, the C-suite. It's all, you know, it's, it's a really, um, fascinating industry that is, um, just so important to most people's every day. And I think Greg, you know, you were talking about earlier, you know, it's just like, you know, the pandemic, the, one of the good things is if there could be a good thing from a pandemic, you know, it brought, you know, supply chain and supply chain professionals um, to the forefront and to yeah. C-suite, you know, because it became such an important aspect, you know, and it, and it kind of brought supply chain, you know, it brought, brought, brought sexy back for supply chain, uh, if you will. <laughs> so. Right. So, the, so if you uh, want to play that music as we, right. yeah, it's good. <laughs> the backbone of society, undoubtedly. Um, all right, Lee, I really appreciate that. I'm going to get Greg's final word in just a minute. But folks, make sure you connect with Lee uh, Classical. Connect with, follow him, invite him. Every time I turn around, Lee, you're doing another keynote, another conference or uh, event somewhere. So also check out Bloomberg Intelligence. And we're going to make it easy. You're going to be one click away in the episode notes of connecting and uh, with Lee and, and his whole team. So, Greg, uh, before we wrap here, what is one of your favorite? We've covered a lot of ground here in the last hour. 
what's one thing that folks got to keep front and center based on something that we've talked about here today? Well, I think to Lee's earlier point, optimism is one of the things you have to keep in mind. Look, much of this is outside of our control. And um, I, I want to assure folks, those folks who had walked away from us, Lee and Scott, at, at uh, cocktail parties until after the pandemic, as soon as we said the words supply chain or logistics, right? They didn't know or care or want to know. And you literally watch their eyes gl glass over. But now they're interested. I want you to understand that the people in logistics, the people in supply chain, people in manufacturing, they have seen all of these disruptions before, not necessarily on the scale that they have, not necessarily for the same reasons, but disruption is a natural element of supply chain. And, and the professionals in this organization or in this industry are equipped to deal with that, right? So, uh, you know, the optimism is it's going to be rough going, obviously, right? But this, these kind of, of disruptions have happened before. Ships have gotten stuck in the Suez Canal. We've had freezes that have shut down um, petroleum product production. You know, we've had weather, we've had wars, we've had all sorts of, of uh, things happen that have, that have impacted the, the reliability or the speed or the cost or the sustainability of the supply chain understand that the organization that the industry is equipped to attack this the one thing we could use is less government intervention fewer wars would be nice fewer um ebbs and flows in terms of of um expeditious regulation or or restrictive regulation and that those sorts of things i mean obviously the global shutdown did not help but we're recovering from that um so look 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 forward to the fact that this has been done before. It's it happened also in 2008, the Great Recession, and in, and in between for a, a multitude of other reasons. So we got this. That's right. Uh, a nice optimistic note to wrap up today's show on. Uh, big thanks, uh, Lee, Claskow, Lee Claskow with Bloomberg Intelligence. Thanks uh, for joining us, Lee. Thanks for having me. Like I, like I said in the beginning of the show, it's always a pleasure to talk to you guys and talk to your audience and, you know, can't wait to do it again. Yeah, great having you, Lee. Absolutely. Greg, always a pleasure uh, to knock out these conversations with you. Enjoyed uh, you and Lee's uh, observations here today. My pleasure. I enjoyed Lee's. <laughs> <laughs> so, folks, uh, hopefully our listeners most importantly enjoyed it. I tell you, it's a treat to get together with Lee on a regular basis, which is why he's been moving up the charts in terms of our repeat guests here at Supply Chain Now since the very beginning. The OG, One of the OGs here. Um, you need folks, to put on your Casey Kasem voice, right? <laughs> That's he's moving right. up the charts. Moving up the charts. That's right. Um, hey, uh, folks, hopefully you enjoyed this episode. Be sure to find Supply Chain Now wherever you get your podcasts from. Hey, including YouTube. Uh, which is a, it's free and easy. It's probably perhaps one of the easiest platforms to lean into all the content that we produce here. But most importantly, uh, on behalf of our entire team here, uh, Scott Luton wishing you all the best, uh, but do good, give forward, be the change. And with that said, we'll see you next time right back here at Supply Chain Now. Thanks, everybody. Thanks for being a part of our Supply Chain Now community. Check out all of our programming at SupplyChainNow.com and make sure you subscribe to Supply Chain Now anywhere you listen to podcasts and follow us on Facebook, LinkedIn, Twitter, and Instagram. See you next time on Supply Chain Now.